Book 10, The Odyssey, Helios, the Lacedonis, Sears. Thence we went on to the Ionian island of Erelius, Helios, Son of Hippotas, dear to the immortal gods. It is an island that floats, as it were, upon the sea, iron down with a wall that girds it. Now Helios has six daughters and six lusty sons, so get made the sons very the daughters, and they all live a fear, their dear father and mother, feasting and enjoying every conceivable kind of luxury. All day long, the atmosphere of the house is loaded with the savior of roasting meats till it groans again, guard and all, but by night, they sleep on their well made bedsteads, each with his own wife, between the blankets. These were the people among whom we had now come. Helios entertained me for a whole month, asking me questions all the time about Troy and the Argive fleet, and the return of the I told him exactly how everything had happened, and when I said I must go, he asked him to further me on my way, and he made no sort of that set about to assume at once. Moreover, he played me a prime ox hide to hold the ways of the roaring winds, which he shut up in the tide of it as a sack, for Zeus had made him captain over the winds, and he could stir on still each one of them according to his own pleasure. He put the sack in the ship and the bound in the mouth so tightly with a silver thread that not even a breath of a side wind could blow from any quarter. The west wind, which was fair for us, did he alone let blow as it chose, but it all came to nothing, for we were lost through our own folly. Nine days and nine nights did we sail, and on the tenth day our naked land showed on the horizon. We got so close that we could see the subtle fires burning, and I being the dead we fell into a light sleep, where I had Never let the rudder out of my own hands that we might get home the faster. On this, the men fell to talking among themselves and said I was bringing back gold and silver in the sack that Helios had given me. Bless my heart, with one turns his neighbor, saying, How this man gets honored and makes friends to whatever city or country he may go see what fine prizes he is taking home from Troy. While we, who have traveled just as far as he has come back with hands as empty as we set out, but, and now Helios has given him ever so much more. Quick, let us see what it is all his, and how much gold and silver there is in the sack he gave him. Thus they talked, and the evil counsels prevailed. They loosed the sack whereupon the wind flew howling forth and raised the storm that carried us weeping out the sea and away from our own country. Then I awoke and knew not whether to throw myself into the sea or to live on and make the best of it. But I bore it, covered myself up, and lay down in the ship while the men lamented bitterly as the fierce wind, winds bore our fleet back to the Helian island. When we reached it, we went ashore to take in water and dine hard by the ships. Immediately after dinner, I took a herald and one of my men and went straight to the house of Helios, where I found him feasting with his wife and family. So we sat down at as suddenly and saw on the threshold. They were astounded when they saw us and said, Odysseus, what brings you here? What God has been ill-treating you? We took great pains to further you on your way home to Ithaca, or whatever it was that you wanted to go to. Thus did they speak, I answered sorrowfully, my men have undone me, they, and cruel sleep have ruined me. My friends bend me this mischief for you, if you will. I spoke as movingly as I could, but they said nothing till their father answered, Bile is the mankind, get you gone at once out of the island, him from heaven's haste. Well, I in no wise help, we are before you come here as one head lord of heaven. And of these words he sent me sorrowing from his door. Thence we sailed sadly on till the men were worn out with long and fruitless rowing, for there was no longer anyone to help them. Six days and night and day did we toil, and on the seventh day we reached the rocky stronghold of Lamas, Telepheus, and the city of the Lacedonians, where the shepherd who is driving in a sheep and goes to the milk salutes him, who is driving out his flock to feed, and his last answer is a salute. And that countryman who can do without sleep might earn double wages, one is a herdsman of cattle, another is a shepherd, for they work much the same by night as they do by day. When we reached the harbor, we found it to landlock under sea cliffs, with a narrow entrance between two headlines, thy captain took all their ships inside, and made them pass close to one another. For there was never so much as a breath of wind inside, but it was always dead calm. I kept my own ship outside and moored it to a rock at the very end of the place, and I climbed a high rock to reconnoiss areas, but could see no sign, neither of them nor cattle, only smoke rising from the ground, so I sent two of my company with an attendant to find out what sort of people the inhabitants were. The men who when they got on shore followed a level road by which the people draw their firewood from the mountains into the town, so presently they met a young woman who had come outside the water, and who was daughter to a Lacedonian named Antipates. She was going to the fountain at Artaxia, from when the people bring their water, and when my men had come close up to her to ask her who the king of the country might be, and over what kind of people he ruled. So he directed them to her father's house, and when they got there, they found his wife to be a giantess as huge as a mountain, and they were horrified at the sight of her. She had once called her husband Antipates from the place of that assembly in Portsmouth. He set about killing my men. He snatched up one of them and began to take making his dinner, him off him, and there whereon the others she ran back to the ships as fast as they could. But Antipates raised a hue and cry after them, and thousands of sturdy Lacedaemonians sprang up from every quarter. Ogres, not men, they threw vast rocks at us from the cliffs as they had been mere stones, and I heard the horrid sound of the ships crouching out against one another, and the death cries of my men as the Lacedaemonians spared them like fishes and took them home to eat them. While they were thus killing my men without the harbor, I drew my sword, cut the cable of my own ship, and told my men to row with all their might, but they too could not there, like the rest, so they laid out for their lives, and were thankful enough when we got into open water, out of reach of the rocks that hurled at us. As for the others, there was not one of them left, hence we sailed sadly on, glad to have escaped death, though we had lost our comrades and came to the in, in island where Sears lives, a great and coming goddess, who is own sister to the magician, Aetis, for they are both children of the sun by curse, who is daughter to Oceanus. We can brought our ship into a safe harbor without a word, for some god guide us other. And having landed, we lay there for two days and two nights, worn out in body and mind, when the morning of the day came, I took my spear into my sword, and went away from the ship to the reconnaissance or, and see if I could discover signs of human handiwork, or hear the sound of voices climbing to the top of the high wall, and I saw the smoke of Sears' house rising upward amid against force of trees. When I saw this, I doubted whether, having seen smoke, I should not go back for once and find out more, and then I deemed best to go back to the ship and give them their and send them on them instead of going myself. When I had nearly got back to the ship, some gods could you upon my solitude and send a fine antler stag right into the middle of my path. He was coming down his pasture, and the horses drank out of the river, where the heat of the sun drove him, and as I passed, I struck him in the middle of the back. The bronze point of the spear went going through him, and he laid running the dust until the life went out of him. Then I sent my foot upon him and threw my spear from the wound and laid it down. I also gathered rough grass and rushes, and twisted them to the path more so, with the good stout rope, with which I bound forth the four feet of the noble creature, together having so done my hung him, bound my neck, and walked back to the ship, leaning upon my spear, for the stag was much too big for me to be able to carry him on my shoulder, setting him on with one hand, as I threw him down in front of the ship. I called the men spoke to him, big man, my man, to each of them. Look here, my friends, said I, we are not going to die so much before our time after all, and at any rate we will not starve, so long as we have got something to eat and drink on board. On this they uncovered their heads upon the seashore and admired the stag,
Listen, therefore, to me. We have no idea where the sun either sets or rises, so that we do not even know east from west. I see no way out of it. Nevertheless, we must try and find one. We are certainly on an island, for I went as high as I could this morning, and I saw the sea reaching all around to the horizon. It lies down, but towards the middle, I saw smoke rising from the thick of the forest of the trees. Their hearts sank as they heard me, for they remembered how they had been treated by the Lacedaemonian Antipathes, and by the savage ogre Polyphemus. They wept bitterly in their dismay, but there was nothing to be caught by crying, so I divided them into two companies and set a captain over each. I gave one company to Eurylochus, while I took command of the other myself. Then we let cast lots, and a helmet, and the left fell upon Eurylochus, so he set out with his twenty two men, and they wept, as also did we, who were left behind. When they reached Circe's house, they found it built of cut stones on a site that could be seen from far, in the middle of the forest. They were wild mountain wolves and lions prowling all around it, poor bewitched creatures whom she had tamed by her enchantments and drugged into subjection. They did not attack my men, and wagged their great tails fawned upon them, and rubbed their noses lovingly against those hounds crowded round their master when they see him coming from dinner, for they know he will bring them something. Even so did these wolves and lions with the great claws upon me, upon my men, but the men were terribly frightened at seeing such creatures. Presently they reached the gate of the goddess's house, and as they stood there, they could hear Circe's within so soft and such dazzling colors as no one but a goddess would leave on this politest, whom I valued and trusted more than any other of my men said, There is something inside, working a loom and singing most beautifully. The whole place resounds with it. Let us call her and see whether she is woman or goddess. They called her, and she came down and fastened the door and bade them enter. They, thinking no evil, followed her all except your locus, who suspected mischief and stayed outside. When she had got them into her house, she set them upon benches and seats and mixed them a mess of cheese, honey meal, and the cream of wine. But she drugged it with wicked poisons to make them forget their homes, and they had drunk. She turned them into pigs by a stroke of her wand and shut them up in her pasties. They were like pigs, had hair and all they granted just as pigs do, but their senses were the same as before, and they remembered everything. Thus then were they shut up squealing and Circe, then threw them, them some acorns and beech masks, such as pigsies. But here Lucas hurried back to tell me about the sad fate of our comrades. He was so overcome with their dismay that he tried to speak. He could find no words to do so, and his eyes filled with tears, and they could only stop sigh till at last we forced this story out of him, and he told us what had happened to the others. We once said he has told he was through the forest, in the middle of it there was a fine house built with cut stones in a place that could be seen from far. There we found a woman or else she was a goddess, looking at her loom and singing sweetly. So the men shouted to her and called her, whereon she had once came down and opened the door and invited us in, but they did not suspect any mischief. So they followed her into the house, and I stayed where I was, where I thought there might be some treachery. From that moment I saw them anymore, for not one of them ever came out, though I sat a long time watching for them. Then I took my sword of bronze and slung it over my shoulders. I also took my bow and told Harry Lucas to come back with me and show me the way. But he laid hold of me, with both his hands, and spoke piteously, saying, Sir, do not force me to go with you, but let me stay here, for I know you will not bring one of them back with you, nor he even return alive yourself. Let's rather see if we cannot escape at any rate with you that are left of us, for we may still save our lives. Stay where you are, then answered I, eating and drinking at the ship, but I must go, for I am most urgently bound to do so. Well, this I left the ship and went out in mind when I got through the charmed grove and was near the great house of Enchantress. Sirius, I met Hermes with his golden wand. This house is a young man in the heyday of his youth, and the beauty of the dam just coming upon his face. He came up to me and took my hand within his own, saying, My poor unhealthy man, whither are you going up over this mountain top alone without knowing the way? Your man shut up in Sirius's pickest trees, so like so many wild boars in their lairs, you surely do not fancy that you can set them free. I can tell you that you will never get back and will have to stay there with the rest of them, but never mind, I will protect you and get you out of your difficulty. Take this herb, which is one of the great virtues, and keep it about you. When you go to Sirius's house, it will be a talisman to you against every kind of mischief. Then I will tell you all the way you wish.